Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Carlos de Leon. I'm with John King and Brenda Little, and we want to welcome you to today's webinar, uh, Developing Effective Workflows. Before we get started, I would like to cover a few housekeeping notes. Today's webinar is being recorded, and all participants are currently in listen-only mode. Please go ahead and place your phones on mute if you haven't done so already to eliminate any background noises. Um, we will intermittently uh, put you off mute when we open the floor for questions and answers. When you would like to speak, please unmute your line and follow the on-screen prompt. If you're using your computer speakers, please mute those as well. If you are not speaking, you can find the call-in number for the webinar on the right-hand side of your screen. Also, throughout the webinar, questions may be submitted through the webinar by typing your questions into the dialog box to the right of your screen and sending it to the organizer. We'll answer as many questions as possible as time allows after you, uh, our speakers have presented. If you have at any point during this webinar experienced any technical difficulties, please call Citrix Tech Support at 888-259-8414. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Joan King. Hi, good. Let me think. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. I always have to do that two-hour deduction of time since Verna and Carlos and I are on the East Coast. Um, welcome to this webinar, and I am very excited about today's webinar because some of you have met Verna a little. Some of you will be meeting her. Verna and I have I've had the privilege of working with Verna on several projects now over the last year and a half, actually almost two years. And it has been a delight. Verna is that rare combination of smart businesswoman, smart clinician, and wonderful human being. Um, it's not always that we all come in, all three things come in one, one package. So um, really happy to have her. Verna is, um, I'm going to get this wrong, Chief Operating Officer. I think that's right. She'll correct me if it isn't. At the Family Institute in New York City. So a large FQAT system, so she does this work every day. And really excited about this topic today around developing um, clinical pathways. And I unfortunately cannot stay on the webinar. Verna has promised to give me my own private tutorial on this um, because I'm in our DC office today and we're having a consulting meeting. But I am going to leave you in the good and capable hands of Verna and Carlos. Verna? Thank you so much. That was a, an amazing introduction, Joan. Hopefully I'm going to live up to that high bar. Um, so thank you very much. I, I appreciate the introduction and mostly I appreciate um, being able to spend some time with all of you today and all of you taking time out of your days um, to spend time on the webinar. So I appreciate it. And just a couple of um, pieces to start. So what I can do is I can actually watch the chat box as we go along. So for those of you who are shy um, and would like to type your questions into the chat box, then certainly feel free to do that. Or also, if you'd like to ask questions as we go along, feel free to put them in the chat box and I will watch them. We will also, as Carlos mentioned, open the lines at the end um, so that we can have some discussions. And I look forward to having discussions. It's really helpful if you have you know, specific questions or things that you'd like to talk about to bring them up. So it, you know, as you ask the questions, there's probably others who have the same question and can learn from the discussion. So um, hopefully that will work for everyone. But again, don't be afraid to put questions in the chat as we go along. Um, so what we're going to try to do today, um, we got a couple of topics that we're going to try to hit. Um, we're going to think about the definition and the importance of a workflow. We're going to talk about the difference between workflows and pathways. We're going to talk about initiating and providing treatment and how workflows sort of tie into those pieces. We're going to look at some, champ, um, some samples and we're going to talk about some tools and, and resources that you might be able to have to do this work. So Carlos, I don't think I have the ability to move the slides. Are you going to drive them or do you want to turn that over? Okay, good. Um, so what is a workflow? Very basic question. 
Um, so we talk about workflows a lot, and for some of you um, that Joan and I have visited, we often ask you about workflows. And I think because it's so important to think about the who, how, when, and where things are going to be done right from the beginning to end. Um, and what it does is it really helps you think through some new processes, some new programs, some new services, initiatives, and really helps you to ask the questions as you go along, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, I know many of you are working on collaborative care or depression care, integrated care projects, and thinking about all of the pieces around engaging patients, initiating treatment, tracking treatment, how you're going to look at outcomes, um, and what's happening. So workflows can help with all of those different pieces, and we'll sort of give some examples and talk a little bit about why we're even doing workflows and, and how they can be helpful. So the difference between a workflow and a pathway, and we'll show examples of both, I really would encourage everyone to have both. Um, so a workflow sort of tells you who does what and when they do it. Um, where a pathway is really more of a clinical model, taught less about who does what versus what happens next. Um, so as an example, this is how we care for patients with depression, with ADD, who are at risk for suicide. Um, and I've really come to use them across the board for a lot of different diagnoses. And I do it in a way that I think um, I've learned is sort of helpful for thinking through. So if we were going to provide excellent care to someone with depression, what would that look like? When would we you know, what tools would we use? What steps would we take? How would we provide excellent care to someone at risk for suicide? Well, this is how we might identify them, and then this is what we might do, and then we might want to use the Columbia scale. This is when we would use a safety plan. And so it really takes somebody through what the process would be. And it really helps you think through your clinical services and how that works, and focuses a little bit less on who does what. Um, versus what happens. And so we do have an example of a pathway that Carlos can pull up. Um, this is, again, sort of a little bit difficult to see because it's very hard to put things um, into some of these slides. But it gives you a little bit of an example of what a pathway looks like versus what um, a workflow might look like. And we can certainly share, you know, we'll give contact information at the end. And I am certainly glad to share with any of you pathways um, for depression, for anxiety, for suicide risk, for ADD, so that you can get a sense of what some of them look like and, and even take um, as a foundation for what might be helpful in your organizations. Um, and these pathways are also really helpful for new staff so that you can say, this is how we care for patients in our organization with depression. Um, so just thinking about that. But you can see how they look a little bit different than workflows. Go ahead. So when we talk about why we're doing this work and particularly talking about workflows, it's really important to doc document the process so that you're really holding people accountable and you're reminding people. And for those of you who have had the pleasure to meet Nick from the National Council, you know, he said not that long ago on a webinar and it reminded me, you know, eight different ways, eight times eight ways, you know, to remind staff and to really um, reinforce some processes that you want. And so workflows help document the process. Um, they really help you take each step into consideration. And it talks to people on the team about how things are going to get done, right? It also makes sure that things get done. Um, and it allows you to go through the process. So in other words, um, one of my favorite things to do in insight visits and, and talking to people about integrated care or collaborative care is to go, you know, and to, to find a staff person or to talk to folks about the workflow. And I very often find someone who says, well, I do that. That's my responsibility. This box on the workflow is mine. Um, and then I always like to ask them, well, what happens if you weren't here? You know, what would that look like? Um, and how would that change this workflow, or what should this workflow look like that's different? Um, and so it allows you to ask a, a lot of different questions like that. Um, go ahead. And so thinking about workflows and what's going to happen and when, it's really important to think about identifying the patients that 
you want to try to do a workflow for. So thinking about, um, for example, many times we talk to organizations about doing workflows for depression care. And they'll have a box on the top and it talks about patient comes into clinic um, or patient comes into center, um, patient identified with depression. And you want to start to really think about, well, who is this patient, right? So is this workflow for everyone, right? Is it for newborns? Is it for seniors? Um, is it for everyone? So if I'm doing a workflow for depression, are we including bipolar patients? Are we including patients who have um, other diagnoses, such as schizophrenia? Are we including people with cognitive impairments? Um, you know, are there people that we don't want to include here? So if we're doing a workflow for depression screening, right, do we not want to include patients who are bipolar or patients who, you know, have significant impairments? Um, how often do we want to screen people? What does that look like? So many times we'll be looking at a workflow and it'll say screen for depression. How often are we screening for depression? So not only who are we screening for depression, but how often are we screening for depression? Is it once a year? Is it once a month? Is it, you know, whenever somebody comes in? Um, is it only when they come in for an initial visit and then for ongoing? Um, what happens if we do it once a year, but then maybe I get diagnosed with a major illness or maybe I have a major life event? Would we want to have a workflow that says that I get screened again? And so often it's really helpful to ask yourself when you're doing a workflow, who is this workflow for, workflow for exactly? What patient population? What ages? And then also, how often does this workflow apply? Go ahead. And thinking about entry. So when we start thinking about workflows and we start talking about how people are going to enter the workflow, right? So how patients are going to start out, what the first box is going to be on our workflow. And I mentioned many times, you know, um, organizations will have, you know, patient enters the center. Um, and then they'll get screened for depression or they'll get a, you know, expert screening. They'll get asked about substance abuse or family violence. Um, or and so starting to think about, well, there's all different kinds of patients that come in. Some patients walk in and they don't have an appointment and, and we're not expecting them. Um, some patients are existing patients. We have new patients that come in that we don't know at all. Um, we have patients that are in crisis. So if I'm you know, having a medical or a mental health crisis, is there going to be a different workflow or does this workflow apply to those patients, right? Or there's also specialty areas. So I was in a program the other day and they were um, doing screenings for substance abuse and depression and they had a workflow and I said, who are all those people in the waiting room? You know, because all of you are sitting here and they said, well, those are the people that are coming in, you know, for our community health worker program and they had another program. And I said, so this workflow only applies to people in, in which programs, right? So it's not everybody coming in. It's only people in certain programs. Or many times primary care offices will have, you know, specialty providers like cardiologists or, you know, someone that comes to practice. Does this workflow apply to them or do they need to be carved out of this, right? Or are there patients who are coming in from community-based organizations that, you know, might have something different or maybe were screened at some other place. Um, so those are all the different things to think about. So sometimes when you're doing a workflow, this is the time to really get into these details when you think about, you know, patient coming in, how many different ways patients and different types of patients come into our, our settings. Go ahead. So when we think about um, doing workflows, there's a couple of different ways to do it. Um, and we're going to show you some examples. And again, it, you know, I apologize. We can certainly send samples. It's hard to stuff things onto to PowerPoint screens that, you know, many of you can see. Um, but one of the helpful ways to do workflows, at least to start, is to figure out who does what and when. Um, and divide it out. So these are the things that the patient might do. Here's some things that, you know, front desk might do or nursing might do. And here's some things that providers will do. So sometimes, you know, at least initially when you're starting to do workflows, you might want to start with a template that says, what are all the different pieces 
who do we have involved in this workflow, what staff, what patients are going to be involved in this workflow, and then what are some of the things that each of them are going to do, and maybe divide it out so that you can start to look at different pieces of it and then decide how they fit all together. Go ahead. So one of the big pieces around doing a workflow is to really note decision points and support. So when does something have to happen? When does somebody make a decision? When is there a yes or a no or an in or an out? So that you can really highlight those pieces. Um, and I think it's incredibly important to start to think about workflows. Go ahead, you can change the slide. So I think that it's incredibly important to think about decision points and workflows um, prior to doing some of the other pieces. And so many times we will work with organizations and they're doing a workflow, um, but they've already hired some staff or they've already got some systems in place. And I really encourage people to do workflows first because there are many times when hiring a certain staff person with a certain license or changes your workflow um, or something very similar to that change the workflow. And so it's important to really think through your workflow first. One of the things that I know about workflows is once you get one and you get it in place, it's very hard to change it. Um, because people say, you know, this is kind of what we do and it starts to be a system and it's very hard to change that. And so I really encourage people to think about their workflows and how all the pieces are going to come together as they're starting to build their services. Again, because it helps you think through all the moving pieces and also because it helps you really put something together that's going to be meaningful for staff and help you change systems. So it's good to go through and identify all of the different points to which somebody needs to make a decision. So when somebody comes in and they get a screening tool such as the PHQ-2, it could be positive or it could be negative. If positive is one direction, negative something else happens. If I'm screening for substance abuse, if somebody scores um, that they're at risk for suicide, if somebody you know presents in crisis. And so all of the places in your, your system, if you think about your program and your services, where there's a decision to be made, where there could be a yes or a no or a here or a there, those are places to really highlight and really begin to draw attention to and think through. Are there only two decisions here? Who needs to make these decisions? What is this going to look like? And how are we going to reflect that in a workflow? And a lot of organizations will mark the decision points differently. Um, and we'll show you some examples of that going forward. Go ahead. So as an example, if there's a decision point, then um, maybe you might have those marked in red, or you might do something different. Um, or you might want to think about um, a lot of times organizations will um, make decision points around particular scores in depression screening. So if a PHQ score is you know, between 5 and 9, then we do this. Um, or if a PHQ score is between 10 and 15, we do this. Um, I actually don't encourage that because a lot of times that tends to be um, problematic for organizations because people then follow the workflows um, and many times what happens is that you could have a patient that um, scores a 22 as an example um, but maybe stop taking medications because they lost their insurance and had some other stressors that could be, you know, engaged in some short-term treatment, um, receive some medications and, and actually do quite well in a short period of time and be very appropriate, um, you know, for services and where somebody who maybe scores a 12 could actually be very high risk with multiple comorbid conditions, who could not have stable housing, who could be in an abusive you know, relationship, who could um, you know, have multiple trials of, of failed medications. And so that person, even though they have a lower score, could be much higher risk. And so that sort of gives you an example of things to think through during your workflows, because if you have a workflow that categorizes out by PHQ score, then you know what's going to happen um, with some of these other scenarios and how is that going to be reflected in your workflow. And then also thinking about other decision supports just because we're, we're talking about depression and many of you are probably working on depression care 
programs and, and part of your integrated or collaborative care uh, implementation efforts. And so what do we do if the patient score you know, drops in the PHQ and what do we do if it doesn't? So if the patient doesn't improve and the score doesn't drop, then you know we need to talk to our consulting psychiatrist and so that's a decision support. We need to notify the primary care provider. So those are you know things that would be reflected in your in your workflows. Go ahead. So again, thinking about the PHQ scores and sort of showing when decisions might be made and what that's going to look like. And do you actually want to put, so some organizations will put maybe a little guide or key like this in the corner of their workflow or include it in their workflow and we'll show some examples of that as we're going along. So workflows can be as detailed um, as you want. I think the thing to think about workflows, and one of the key questions is, why am I doing this workflow? And if the answer is, you know, because Verna or Joan were here and they asked us to do a workflow, um, that's, that's not what we're hoping um, you will say. We're hoping that you will really take the opportunity to think through um, and one of the nice things about workflows is that if you do one that really fits the services and, and is really a helpful guide to the services, you can actually use that as a tool for new staff. You can use it as a tool for funders if you're applying for grants. You can use it when a regulatory organization comes in. I recently had the the pleasure, for lack of another word at the moment, of having Joint Commission come and we certainly did give them you know, workflows and pathways, and, and then they were able to see that we had thought out our processes and how we cared for patients, both from a, a workflow, who does what, and both, and also from a clinical pathway. So thinking about why am I, why am I doing a workflow? Because I really want to take the opportunity to think through every step that we're going to need to go through in order to provide this excellent care, in order to really make sure we have all of our bases covered for the scenarios that are going to happen in our centers, to be able to train new staff. So there's lots of reasons to do a workflow. But those are also going to dictate the kind of workflow you do and what it looks like and how much detail. So I know that sometimes organizations will have one workflow, you know, maybe for suicide risk care, and then they will have specific workflows for nursing, for, you know, behavioral health, for primary care, or all of the different, you know, parts of the organization or disciplines might have a separate workflow that kind of feeds off a larger workflow. And so I think the first question to ask yourself is, you know, do I have a workflow? Why am I doing this workflow? And also to put a process in place because one of the things that sometimes happens is, you know, maybe there's a change and you pull out a workflow and you realize that, you know, it no longer applies. And so if you're taking the time to really put together a thoughtful workflow, then what is the process going to be like to update that workflow? Who's going to be responsible for it? And when is that going to happen? I know one of the things that's helpful is yearly in our management meeting, we pull out the workflows and the pathways and we go through them. Or sometimes I'll assign them out and say, okay, go through these and, and see if you have any thoughts about things that have changed or, you know, look at it with a new set of eyes, both what we've learned clinically and, and how some of our internal processes have changed and also resources. We add staff, we add care navigators or peers or community health workers or new providers. And so that often changes your workflows. Um, so really trying to put some processes in place to be able to look at, at those things. Go ahead. So one of the things about the decision supports is also really to be able to give people information. So what sometimes people will include in work plans are little keys like this to be able to show decision supports and give people some very clear direction about what they should do in this particular situation. And so again, really thinking about the kind of detail that's going to be helpful to staff to put in your your workflows. I know one time I um, was working with an organization and they were telling me they spent a lot of time on, on their workflows and they were really, you know, having team meetings and, and thinking it through. Um, and I asked them to send me a copy of their, their workflow 
um, and they said, it's on the way. And I said, what do you mean? And they said, no, it's, it's on the way. We mailed it to you. Um, and I got a large tube in the mail with a poster that actually took up a good chunk of my office wall. Um, and so I don't think it's always helpful to do something with such great detail, because what they did essentially was really um, put in every detail. Um, and I think that it was really helpful because it allowed them to really think through all of the processes. Um, and that was incredibly helpful. But I think what it was is it was so detailed. I actually still have it up. It was so detailed that it really wasn't helpful to the line staff. And so they wound up breaking it down in different components. But it was incredibly helpful for them to really think about all of the details of their processes. And so, you know, you may want to have documents that are attached to or addition, you know, to your workflows. So just something to think about. Go ahead. So again, to think about the level of detail. So I know that in some organizations, they might put medication suggestions. They might put, if they're going to exclude um, certain populations from a screening program, they might list them. Um, they might also talk about listing an evidence-based practice. So if you're doing a workflow for how you're you know, treating or caring for patients with attention deficit, then, you know, when do we do the Vanderbilt? How often does the Vanderbilt happen? Is there an evidence-based practice that we use when we're caring? Um, and where can staff get that information? So if you're designing workflows that will be helpful for new staff, then that's often something that you might want to think about and you might want to include as a, as a level of detail um, for the workflows that you're doing. Go ahead. And so again, the level of detail, so here's a medication list. And I think you know it's helpful to really think about one of the things that um, it means, though, is that if you're going to include a lot of detail, how often you know medications change a lot, practices change a lot. So you want to think about, you know, is the level of detail going to be helpful? How, how often am I going to review it? Because the more detail you put in, then the more likely it is, is that you're going to have to update it more frequently. And so it's always kind of a, a delicate balance. What I would say, though, is that the level of detail to really think it through and maybe have supporting documents is helpful, especially when you might be doing your initial workflow development. Then it really is helpful to sort of dive into the weeds and really think through all of the different processes. Go ahead. So thinking about what you want to do, and you know, one of the reasons that we're all in this work is to help people get better. And so a lot of times um, on the workflows, you really want to say, what does it mean for somebody to get better? How do we define better, right? What are we requiring of staff in terms of frequency of contacts, right? So again, sort of talking about depression care. If someone is not getting better, uh, maybe their PHQ is not is not going down or decreasing, then do we expect the depression care manager or the behavioral health provider or you know someone to do something different? Do we expect them to follow up more? Do we expect them to follow up weekly instead of every other week? Um, if someone is getting better and we have a plan in place for relapse, what does that mean? What do we do differently, right? And so, one of the things about developing a workflow is that in order to answer some of these questions about how often do we want someone to be contacted or what do we expect people to do, we have to think about, well, what is our end, right? Where do we want to get? What does, this, what does the end of this workflow look like? And so what is our outcome here? So if our outcome is to help people get better for depression, what does that mean? What does that look like? Um, and what are some of the steps along the way. And so it's often helpful to define the beginning and the end of the workflows first, and then piece all of the different details in the middle. Um, and I think that can be incredibly helpful. But it's really you know, thought-provoking to think about where do we want to go, what's the point of this workflow, and where do we want to see staff end up, and where do we want patients to be at the end. Go ahead. 
So thinking about some sample charts and we can show some, you know, I think it's incredibly important to have something that's individual for your organization. You know, many times, you know, we see projects and then we see organizations have very similar workflows. Um, and often what I say is, you know, even if you're one organization, many of us have multiple sites. You know, when I think about my own centers, I have homeless sites, I have school-based programs, I have centers that serve HIV patients, I have primary care and dental and behavioral health, um, and maybe I care for patients with, well, I do care for patients with depression in all of them. So we might have a flow chart or a workflow for the organization, but each one of those centers or those programs may have a different workflow. And I think that's okay to think about some local um, variations in the workflows. And also, as you're thinking about your workflows, is this going to work in our other places? Is this going to work in our satellite location? Do they have different resources there? Maybe they don't have as many dedicated staff people, or they don't have a full-time behavioral health person, um, or they don't have a, a front desk person you know, all the time, or, or something like that. And so what is it going to look like? differently. Um, and that's also an important, and one of the things that I always talk to organizations about too is, you know, many times um, now with increased access and expanding programs and, and sometimes, you know, lack of space, organizations are expanding into evening and weekends um, or holidays. And so I often ask, so if I came in, you know, Christmas Day at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, if I came in Saturday morning, if I came in Wednesday night at 7 o'clock, would this workflow still apply? And many times the answer to that question is no, because there's different staffing, there's different models, you know, there's different resources. And so many times a workflow that works during a center or program's busier or fully staffed hours does not work in off hours. And so that's really something to think about. Do you reflect that on the initial workflow and have you know some shaded sections or different decision supports, or do you have a different workflow for those staff and hours? And then how do you sort of make that work logistically? Um, and so thinking about what those workflows look like and maybe identifying a staff person who can be responsible um, and also trying to standardize across, you know, your organization. So these are the things we do all of the time. Um, these And here's how they get done in some places and here's how they get done in other places. Or here's things that we only do in some places and what are those things. Um, and really thinking out what the workflows are. And those are sort of all things that need to be taken into consideration. Go ahead. So this is just an example of you know, what a workflow can look like um, and thinking about how you can take it through. So in these kinds of workflows, which is the kinds of workflows that people tend to go to first, um, so I think to think about are there different shapes that you want to use to represent different things. So do I want to use a, a triangle, you know, if there's a decision to be made? Do I want to highlight in red certain areas that I want to draw attention to? Or do I want to say nursing is red and behavioral health is blue um, and primary care is gray? Um, do I want to try to, you know, separate this out? Do I need to put a key in here to sort of explain what the different shapes and, and colors mean? And so many times, you know, I think people don't explore the idea of how can I use shapes and what do they mean? Um, are all the circles nursing? So there's a lot of different ways that you can divide it out or is all the red nursing? Um, how am I using my shapes and my colors and what does that look like? And, you know, how am I going to convey the information that I need to? And a lot of that goes back again to why am I doing this workflow? What, what do I hope to accomplish by doing this workflow? And that might help guide some of your thoughts around how do I set it up and what does it look like and how do I really um, bring in all of the, the tools that I have to really make this an effective workflow. How do I send a message, you know, by using some colors and, and shapes? Go ahead. So this is an example of, you know, how complicated workflows can get sometimes. And this is actually 
um, something where you can see here, you know, where they folded in the medications. Um, I've also seen organizations, as you can see here, put things in here like some sample self-management goals for patients, sample medications, sample practices, um, or sometimes I'll see, you know, phone numbers. Um, if this happens, call this person or do this. Um, and so you can put very specific information in here, you know, that might be helpful. And it also matters where you're going to post these. So one of the things that, you know, I always think is, is not helpful is people spend a lot of time doing these workflows and thoughts and then they put them in a binder where uh, workflows go to die um, and nobody really looks at them until it happens to, to come up again. And so thinking about, you know, where would it be helpful to put this workflow that it would be the most helpful for people. And sometimes if you you cross the balance between getting it too complicated, right? Um, and so that means that, you know, often it isn't as helpful to staff because there's too much of a level of detail and then they don't look at it or it's not as impactful. Um, and so you want to try to cross that balance. And you know, where do you put them? Do you put it on bulletin boards? Do you post it around your site so that people can reference it, particularly when um, you know, you're implementing or starting to do something new? Um, it's always helpful to post it around. Do you want to put it in part of your new hire orientation? Um, and does, does the workflow that you use for that, maybe does that need to contain more detail than one that you post? So do you need different versions of your workflow? Go ahead. And so here's another example of maybe using stars or things as decision points. Um, and how different workflows work. So this is, again, just to give you some ideas, some conceptual ideas about how to structure workflows, what some of them look like. Um, and you can see that you can have workflows for you know, depression in this example and how different they can look sort of based on how organizations go through their processes or how people use and, and design their workflows. So meant just to give you some ideas on how to, you know, structure them and set them up in your own organization. Go ahead. So one of the things that I think people often um, overlook is a swim lane um, workflow. And what it does is it really identifies tasks for specific staff roles. Um, and I think that it's a step above one of the, the initial workflows that we showed where you were dividing out what staff do what um, and separating them out by staff lines. Um, I think one of the things about a swim lane is that it actually shows the flow across the different disciplines. Um, and we can pull up an example in the next slide so that we can actually look at it and talk through it a little bit. So one of the things about a swim lane is that you can show all of your different disciplines or different areas on the left-hand side, and then you can take someone through the entire process. Um, and you can see how somebody might go from one discipline or one area to another and then back. Um, so this is really nice because it helps somebody look across and say, okay, I'm a behavioral health provider. This line applies to me. These are all, this is sort of where I fit into the workflow. And then maybe you have a different shape that shows here's where I would need to make a decision or something that I really need to pay attention to. Um, the other piece that swim lanes are really helpful for is that now that all of us are going into this unchartered, you know, value-based payment territory, is that it helps you to then look and say, okay, I have a front desk person here and these are all of the things that they do. And this is about how much time it would take them. And I know how much I pay them, so I could actually assign a cost to this. And then I could go through and do that for each of the categories. So I could assign time. I could assign, I could assign cost. 
um, so I can do it to project and to figure out, well, gee, how much does this cost me and, and how much time might somebody spend here? It's also helpful maybe in figuring out scheduling or figuring out workflows in your center. Um, and so I think that there are real applications for swim lanes, and I think sometimes when we think workflows, we don't automatically think of this format. And so I think it's helpful to put out there because there can be real uses for this format maybe versus the other. Um, so sometimes organizations will say, this is crazy. I've got five different workflows for all of the different you know, disciplines, and, and I said, well, you know, have you thought about, you know, a swim lane where you could maybe try to combine them all? Um, and so I think you really need to think about which would be helpful. I wouldn't think that you might need both of these. Um, you know, I think that you could probably pick one format over the other format um, when you come to, to sort of talking about workflows. Um, but certainly it's good to know that both of those exist and, and what they look like. Go ahead. So I think that, you know, again, this is another example. It's a little clearer for you to be able to see. Um, and, you know, what I think it, it's helpful, again, to really think through processes. And sometimes what's helpful to do is to almost start here doing a swim lane and then, you know, as we talked about earlier, and then maybe moving to another workflow. So if we were to sit down and we say, okay, you know what, we're going to do a workflow, you know, to care for patients in our organization who, you know, are coming in for substance abuse screening, and, and this is what it's going to look like in our new substance abuse screening program, and say, okay, these are all of the things that our front desk has to do. These are all of the things. Let's really sit around, brainstorm every, every role that a, a front desk person is going to play here. Um, they're going to have to schedule appointments. They are going to have to take phone calls from people. They are going to have to, you know, maybe get some crisis phone calls. They're going to, we're going to have to call them when somebody screens positive with the primary care provider. We're going to have to call the front desk and they're going to have to book that person and arrive them on the behavioral health schedule because we're going to refer somebody, you know, for a referral to treatment or to get some kind of a referral for outside you know, higher level of care or to talk to someone. And so all of the things that the front desk is going to have to do, what's all of the things nursing is going to have to do? They're going to have to screen people. If it's positive, they're going to have to do this. They're going to have to tell the provider. They're going to have to do a referral to behavioral health. They're going to have to enter this tool in the system. They're going to have to put this tool in this basket. So all of the things that they're going to need to do and really brainstorm it out. And then that will help you put them all in the different categories. And then you can kind of figure out where, in what order, they might need to happen. Um, and so sometimes I tell people, this is maybe a really good place to start, um, just to do some, some brainstorming. Go ahead. And so again, just giving you some examples of workflows that have, this is for the primary care behavioral health integration project and some workflows that were, you know, put in around some swim lanes and, and what different folks are doing. So you can kind of see how it is and, and see some decision supports. You know, there's decision supports are a triangle here and you can see it sort of talk through. Um, you know, just giving you some ideas so that you can take back and use this for your own organization. Go ahead. So this is another um, way to think about um, what you might need to do for a workflow. This was actually um, something from the AIMS Center um, out of Seattle, Washington around collaborative care. And essentially what it does, and I would recommend this for any of you who are implementing collaborative care, depression care programs, because what it does is it takes you through all of the tasks and who's going to do them. So this is actually a written version of sort of our brainstorming session. This maybe would be the result of a brainstorming session around collaborative care. Who's going to do what? Um, and sometimes it's, you know, when you start doing these activities, here's all the things that need to happen in order to do this work, right? We're going to sit around. We're going to brainstorm all of the different tasks that need to happen. And then once we make our list saying, okay, now who's going to do them? Who does them already? And sometimes when you ask that question, four people raise their hands and you say, well, wait a minute, 
do four people need to do this or can you know we narrow this down does nursing need to do it on the front desk you know what does this look like can we narrow that down a little bit right and then sometimes you're like wait a minute nobody's raising their hand nobody's doing this who should do it right who should really own this task and so this is sort of a preliminary you know tool to also help you sketch out all of the different moving pieces that might need to be a part of your workflow um, and so I encourage you to, you know, use this tool or, you know, there's other similar ones for other diagnoses or other projects. Go ahead. So I think I wanted to, you know, leave a little time for some questions and, and some discussion. Um, we have a, a couple of things in the, the chat box, um, and so I wanted to try to get to those first. Um, you know, a lot of times people say, well, you know, what is the importance of doing a workflow in financial? So there's a financial sustainability and workflows are incredibly connected. Um, and many times, um, one of the prime examples that I often use is an organization might have um, put together a workflow um, for behavioral health in a primary care setting and they might hire um, a licensed master social worker. And um, then they have a workflow in place. And then when they hire this person and they have a lot of Medicare patients, you know, that provider can't bill Medicare. And so they need to do something different um, to incident two with a primary care provider or they need to, you know, do something different around a particular population of patients. And so that changes the workflow. And so I often tell people, think about, you know, your workflows in the beginning um, and really try to put it together when you have your staffing, when you have all your pieces so that you can really think some of these through. And then when you put a workflow out, you don't need to change it around. And so I think that's something that's um, incredibly helpful to do. So there was a question about changing your workflows. So one of the things that's important, changing the workflows really should be a process that maybe happens in a staff meeting or, you know, happens at some sort of a, you know, a regular basis. And so I talked about, you know, having them reviewed yearly. I think it's helpful to do that. Um, and because I think then you have a process in place and you can pull them out and you can, you know, have some discussions. It also helps you rethink things. It's always good to go back with another set of glasses a year later. You know, you see things differently. You've learned things. You've changed some processes. And so, you know, that's really helpful to do. So there was a question around using workflows for training. So I think there's a lot of ways that you can use workflows for training. One is to, to give them out. The other um, that I've learned sort of a little bit and started to do differently over the past couple of years, um, and I'll use, um, I've mentioned ADD a couple of times because that's something, um, you know, one day we sat and we said, what would it look like if we provided excellent care for, for patients in our system who had attention deficit or you know, ADHD, you know, what would what would that look like? Um, and we started to really think that through and started, you know, to put together a workflow. And we thought to ourselves, you know, one of the things for providing excellent care would be that we really need to train staff. You know, we need to make sure that they, we train staff. We need to, you know, train prescribers um, maybe differently around medications. And so what we did is doing that workflow also allowed us to identify all of the different pieces um, that we needed to talk about in the organization in order to change the care we were providing. The other piece that was really helpful is that if we're, you're rolling out a workflow, for example, like this in attention deficit, and you put it in context and, and you combine it with other initiatives. So here's a workflow. Here's a tool that we're going to use. Um, this is where the tool fits in. This is when you use the tool and you train people on the tool at the same time. You use it as an opportunity to give people a refresher on ADD and ADHD, you know, what it is, what it looks like, what the presentation is, sort of a diagnostic 101. You have the opportunity to talk about treatments and do some training so that 
you sort of combine the workflow development and rollout with reviewing your processes. And sometimes it's helpful because rather than say, you know, here we have a new workflow, you know, and how we care for patients with, you know, ADD, if you then combine it with the training pieces, then it's a lot more meaningful for staff and a lot more impactful in terms of making systemic changes. And so I think that it can be helpful, you know, certainly doing some of those processes um, and combining it in with some of the, the training. So I know that we have um, a couple of minutes um, remaining. And so, Carlos, maybe I'll ask you to open the lines and we can see if some folks um, have some questions. Sure. So I'm going to unmute the lines. Yeah, I'm going to un unmute the lines. If I get too much feedback or something like that, I will remute the lines. And a way that we could do this is if individuals who are on the call raise their hand, I could individually unmute your line. So let's hope that this works. <laughs> Lines are being unmuted. We ask that you put your um, phones on mute if you're not um, speaking or if you don't have any questions. And if you did not call in um, to um, type in your questions. One question we did receive, um, Verna, is could you please share the self-assessment tool from the AIM Center? They really sat down and, and went through a pretty great level of detail. I often find it helpful to help me think through other implementations. You know, like I've given it to organizations that are implementing SBIRT and some other things, because um, it just really gives you some ideas around tasks for other implementations. So I would encourage you to look at it, um, even if you're not um, implementing collaborative care. So sorry, Carlos, I think we had some feedback. Did we mute the lines again? No, I saw who, who I muted the individuals online that was producing the feedback. OK, thank you. It's always hard with the conference calls. And I know I understand that many of you are, are multitasking. Um, so certainly, you know, I understand. So one of the questions that um, comes up is whether or not um, or when in the process to start doing workflows. I always tell folks to start doing them right from the beginning when you start doing this work. So if you get a grant, if you decide that you're going to you know, provide a new service or if you're going to you know, do something, then I think it's helpful to start doing the workflow you know, right then and there. And I also think it's helpful. Um, to figure out how you're going to share, you know, your information and your workflows. You know, how are you really going to make sure that the nurse that works, you know, downstairs on the third floor knows what the workflow is and knows what their role is in the workflow? Um, I know one of the things that we, you know, always do in our some of our implementation visits is. You know, I always um, take a copy of the workflow, and I always, you know, try to sneak off. And I find some staff person sitting in the corner, and I hold the workflow up, and I say, where are you on this workflow? And that's always a really good indicator of sort of how information gets disseminated across an organization. Um, and so I would encourage you, you know, to think about that or to do that. You know, what is the implementation plan for your workflow? What does it look like? 
Okay, so we'll give a moment if anybody wants to to not be shy and, and ask questions on the line as opposed to the chat box. I think many of us have gotten used to the chat boxes now. But certainly we can give a moment. Carlos, are there any slides or are there any questions that I'm missing in the chat box? I think we got everyone mm -hmm. in the chat box, right? Yes. Okay. Um, well, I want to put out there, you know, that these are often complicated to do. Um, if people have um, any questions and you want to see sample, you know, workflows and pathways, I think it's really important, you know, the pathways, and we didn't spend as much time on pathways as we did on workflows, um, but it's so important to think about how you're going to care for people with certain diagnoses, what does that look like, and really think it through, and it is much different than a workflow, and I know that it's been incredibly helpful, you know, as a teaching tool, and also set some expectations. Um, in your organizations, and so I would encourage you to really look at both pathways and workflows. And again, we'll make available not just the, the slides with the information on the task list from the AIM Center, but also you know any of the, the pathways. If people are interested in pathways, um, then certainly we can share those as well. Um, and I think they're helpful guides. They're also helpful because sometimes you know, particularly primary care providers, you know, many of you might be, um, I saw my friends from Missoula on the line, you know, working in busy primary care centers doing behavioral health, um, and the, you know, primary care providers say, you know, I'm not going to ask these questions because if someone, you know, says that they're at risk for suicide, then, you know, I don't know what to do and I don't have time. And then you can say, well, you know what, we actually have a process and let me talk to you about it and here's a pathway and here's what happens and here's what your role is and here's a workflow. And so you can sort of have that whole conversation and it's incredibly helpful. So again, you know, anybody who wants any of the information or has additional questions, um, as you go along on your work and, and you think we could be helpful in some way, then please feel free to reach out to us and we'd be certainly glad to get on the line or send you information that might be helpful. Um, so I want to thank everyone for their time today. I don't see um, questions coming into the chat box. And I think we have not, um, if someone has a question before we end, then chime in. I want to thank I everyone. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, don't I don't see any in the chat box. Okay. So I want to thank everyone for your time today. It's greatly appreciated. I know all of you are incredibly busy and work incredibly hard. So I wish all of you a wonderful day. And please do not hesitate to reach out to us if we can be of any help to you. So thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. And I just wanted to um, remind the group um, that there's our upcoming activity for uh, is January 5th, our group coaching call. This is at 1 p.m. Mountain Time, 3 p.m. Eastern Time. The link is there, and I'll send everyone a reminder email as well with this information. I hope everyone enjoyed the webinar, and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.